particular importance for liturgical and pastoral life, there are now 89 minor basilicas in the U.S. For more news with a Catholic perspective, visit EWTNnews.com. I'm Teresa Tomio, and Morning Glory starts now. On the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Live from our nation's capital, this is Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast with Gloria Purvis, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and Father Bjorn Lundberg. Heavenly Father, on this memorial of St. Hyacinth, we invoke him and Saint his intercession and St. Dominic for as patrons of the new evangelization that with, with their great devotion to Our Lady and our Blessed Lord, we can be inspired to bring the good news of Christ to our world today through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. That's Isaiah 60, verse 1 and 2. Amen. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. beautiful. In mm-hmm. fact, there's a, I remember there's a song. I'm not sure if it's a hymn or a responsorial song, but that. With those words there, the, the beautiful, and reminder that, that Jesus is the light that penetrates the darkness mm-hmm. of our world. So I know a lot of people are going through some darkness right now with all this coronavirus stuff, but but you always have hope because Jesus is the light of the world. We got to figure it, out if that's going to be on volume volume one or two of Gloria's new album. Okay, so y'all are trying to get everybody <laughs> upset to listen because they're like, "It's Monday." He's he's joking. He's joking, right, Father? <laughs> Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Yes. Well, you know, maybe we can do an album if they want to cut their time off of purgatory. They can listen to that and say, Lord, Lord, I did my time. Praise and <laughs> um, purification and purgatory. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, they, might not tell, they might not think a, a cat screeching sounds like praising because <laughs> that's about what you might say catawalling uh, instead of praise, but I don't know. Uh, look, we'd love for you all to join the conversation. We're going to have a lot of uh, good conversation today on Morning Glory. We'll be talking about McDonald's money and morals. What is going on there? You know, it'd be interesting to hear what our listeners have to say. You know, if the CEO is doing his job and making y'all some money, why do we care what kind of moral life he's living? Well, we'll see. We'll get you to write in about that. What else are we talking about? We're talking about what is the real power of the Eucharist. Uh, we'll talk about an experience that the Catholic uh, young man had Going back to church after uh, months of being away because of the coronavirus lockdown, had a very interesting response uh, after going back to Mass. We'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. And then we'll hear about St. Hyacinth. It's his memorial today. You may not even know who he is. We're going to learn about St. Hyacinth and how he can be a patron for the new evangelization. And we'd love for you to join the conversation. You can text us by texting the letters E W T N to five five zero zero zero. Wait for response. Text your first name, how you're listening, and then your comment. And please note that may, message and data rates may apply. You can also reach us without paying anything by emailing us at morningglory at ewtn dot com. Now I understand. Um, this this story, this first story, has me just laughing. What is this about weighing people? Yeah, and but before I do this story, I just want to uh, please ask people. Uh, uh, a, a good friend of mine, his name's Jason Angelette. His wife was Elise. Um, they were directors of the Willwoods community, which is a a, a Catholic community um, based on marriage and faith and stuff. And they brought me down for a couple of events. For my, in fact, I brought my wife to one of the events, and he got a chance to meet her. She, his wife Elise, just lost her battle, six year battle with cancer. Oh, no. uh, and died mm. yesterday and they have five young kids and, i read about um, that okay. yeah jason i mean they were such an amazing couple truly in- inspirational and uh so i just want to ask people for their prayers jason and and, and the kids and uh just lost his wife and, and their mom and um yeah i got that news just before i went to bed last night so i was just thinking about it all night and uh mm-hmm. i just want people to pray but uh okay so the story is from China. So you, you might recall that uh, China's had some issues uh, with regard to a massive increase in food prices due to first, you know, coronavirus for one, and then they had this massive flooding. It's driving food prices up. So the government put this pr- uh, program in place about 
you know, not wasting food, which, which, which makes sense. Okay. It makes sense. But here's one's restaurant's response. Imagine, uh, you go to the restaurant, you know, you're visiting China, you hear about the great cuisine there. You go to this restaurant you've been looking forward to going to and, uh, yes. Okay. It's table for two. Yes. Uh, well, okay. We have some scales over here. We need to weigh you before you eat. Oh my gosh. Uh, what? <laughs> yes, yeah, so they put they put people on scales and they weigh them and then they so based on their weight it determines what recommends what dishes they can eat. <laughs> what, wait, what? Is that like so, good luck? Oh, if you weigh more, we give you a better table or something. So, <laughs> so, so their intentions were to to be advocates for stop wasting food and ordering food in a healthy way, but by making customers weigh themselves before that is just that is insane. Who would, th- people, who who would think that? that's a good idea? Yeah, really. Well, and I wonder which one of their if they had any people that agreed to that. How long did that restaurant stay open? I'm <laughs> yeah, going right. to that place. They weigh you. Excuse me, I'm going to McDonald's, but we can't go to McDonald's. Right? We'll bring the baby and put the baby on the scale and say, we're ordering for the baby. <laughs> that steak and mashed potatoes and asparagus is for the baby. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the really do well. <laughs> right, put the baby on so, the scale. Yeah, so customers were asked to stand on scales and scan their data into an app that recommended food choices based on their weight. And the dishes, uh, the amount of uh, caloric value in the dishes. You know, I would love to see what they would have done with a a football team. Because those dudes are normally huge. But you come in there and telling them, hey, based on your weight, you can have an apple. Yeah, yeah, he got some sushi and some salad. (laughs) You know, oh, my goodness. I mean, wow. But did did they just ask the weight? I mean, they're not asking anything else like, Age and height and well, I don't know. It's just it's enter data into an app, <laughs> and then it tells you what he is. Like, yikes! You know, and I, I had a carrot sticks. <laughs> I had a girlfriend from college that she looked very trim, but she was very heavy because she was solid. She was solid muscle because she did um, a lot of weightlifting. And mm-hmm. so it was funny. Um, she said every time she would go to the doctor, the nurse checking him would say, "You know, you need to lose some weight." She says, "No, look at me." She said, "Don't look at the, don't look at what the chart is telling." She said, "Look at me." She says, "I have very little body fat. I'm mostly muscle. That's why I seem so heavy." For uh, she said for her height, uh, but she she looked really trim. It's just a muscle. I don't know. She was just she was just solid. So I wonder what she if she what they would have told her if she went in there and got on the scale. She'd have been like, no, I'll take two steaks, please. Exactly. I don't know what you do with that. Okay. Well, you I know, that would um, go over very well here. I, I don't think <laughs> yeah. so. Well, you know, I don't know if you all remember. I'm sure you do. The West Virginia scandal which, with the Bishop, um, Bishop Michael yes. Bransfield. Well, apparently a plan to ensure that he would make some kind of reparation for the financial and sexual misconduct there <clears> has <throat> still not been implemented. And apparently... He still think he won't admit to wrongdoing and refuses to make amends, you know, to, I guess, pay anything back. But I mean, just to help people remember, he was uh, making 50. Well, I was saying he wasn't. The diocese was getting 15 million dollars annually from a gift that uh, a, a member of the diocese, a Catholic, made a long time ago when, when the person died. They basically <clears throat> gave their um, ownership of an oil field. That oil field was generating $15 million a year for the diocese on top of finding out that the diocese had an endowment of $230 million. Now, West Virginia, that's one of the poorest states in the country. Yeah. And that's right. This oil field these uh, was donated over a century ago. Now, to find out that then the bishop was living a life of luxury, he was cutting four and five figure checks to fellow clerics. He was jetting around in private jets. He was having... Um, decorating his office with they say a hundred dollars worth of fresh flowers each day a hundred dollars worth of fresh flowers each day just for his office so imagine how much that would be over time that he was there he just was very uh flashy we knew that he had um would take private charter jets from west virginia to like dc or baltimore which i mean come on you could drive that but uh so he was really living uh, the very lavish lifestyle. And so he was asked to, well, he was removed in, in the, in the midst of the scandal, but still not at all admitting that he did anything wrong. 
Wow. And so now the article is what, that they don't have contact with him? Well, the article is that he's, um, and my understanding is that he's just not making any amends, is that he's not admitting any wrongdoing or anything. So, okay. so he's not, he's not doing that. And uh, he, so I think it did bring some good attention as to whether or not what kind of uh, authority a bishop has over the, all the funds vested with the diocese. So, because there are questions like, how could he have misused diocesan funds for so long without raising red flags? So, I mean, just a lot's there. He's like, look, in terms in reference to the Texas oil fields, he told people, look, I own this. Oh, yikes! <laughs> yikes! I mean, yeah, well, he's like, I own this. Uh, I mean, you know, at some point, we're all going to have to stand before God and give an account for our life. I mean, what do mm -hmm. you, you know, so if yeah. he doesn't make amends here, he's going to have to stand before Jesus at some point. All of us will, you know, right. so we need we need to be prepared. I think humility is, yeah. is part of this whole thing. Just recognizing, you know what? I'm a sinner. I need to God's mercy. I did wrong. I need to make amends for that. You know, we're we're all called to do that. I guess for me, I'm like knowing at the poverty in the state of West Virginia and knowing you have $15 million of income just off the right. oil field plus oil field. a $230 million endowment. Right. I just don't understand how every child in the diocese wasn't in a Catholic school, you know, with some kind of a, uh, whether they gave a full scholarship or some kind of support to school just from that $230 million endowment. I mean, I just, and then to find, you know, the kind of things that were spent on himself, but we didn't hear of like this super huge, wonderful outreach to everybody in the state in terms of, you know, helping to ameliorate the people living in poverty. I don't know. I have to just, say, I mean, wow. to be honest wow. with you, I don't know if the article covers that. We don't know what good things were being done. I mean, like the money wasn't all being spent. I mean, there was corruption, but I mean, we don't know how that money was used, but it raises a good question about how you have accountability for that kind of income. Because most mm -hmm. dioceses have nothing like that. They don't have a $250 yeah. million dollar yeah. endowment. They don't have a $15 million dollar revenue every year from an oil field. I mean, that's crazy. You think Usually that most dioceses are begging people to give to their annual bishop's kind of you know appeal or whatever. I just would like to know what the people in the uh, diocese were paid. Like, what was their pay? What were their benefits like? You right, know, right. Uh, I really be uh, wondering about that. Uh, just uh, hoping that the that uh, the bishop emeritus will come forward and help to make amends that uh, people are expecting based on how he was spending and living while he was there. Let's see what's up with the rosary rallies. That's awesome. Um, in Wichita, the bishop there, Bishop Kemi, began rallying. The people of the Diocese of Wichita on August 1st with a rosary rally and asking people to pray all the month of August and going into September to pray the rosary every day. And then in Wisconsin, the bishop there, Bishop Donald Hying and the Archbishop of Madison, Jerome Lestecki, had a Unite Wisconsin Eucharistic procession and rally on Saturday where they had a beautiful procession with the Blessed Sacrament that went all the way to the Capitol bunch of Catholic groups got together for that. And then Archbishop Aquila had a rosary rally in Denver, and the Archdiocese was great. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a lot more coming up on Morning Glory. We'll be talking McDonald's, money, and morals. And what else? And we'll also be talking about a wonderful experience, a young man, an interesting experience when he went back to Mass. Listen to us on Alexa. Just say, Alexa, ask EWTN to play Morning Glory. Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast. Father Benedict Groeschel. No Catholic can support abortion and that Catholics are responsible to take serious action against legalized abortion. The leading Catholic voices are on EWTN Radio. Wings is the weekly newsletter that's packed with program info, features, and updates of all that's going on at the Global Catholic Network. Just go to EWTN.com slash wings. Fill out your name and email address, and you'll start getting your wings every week. When you get yours, send it to all your friends, and they can send it to their friends. And pretty soon, we're covering the whole world with the good news about EWTN. Wings, the weekly newsletter from EWTN, the Global Catholic Network. 
The Wisdom of Mother Angelica. Now, when Jesus was on earth, he taught us a great lesson. He taught us that he came for the sinner, not the virtuous. He came for you because you are imperfect, because sin comes easy to you, and sometimes you don't have the willpower to say no. EWTN. Live Truth. Live Catholic. Have you heard of Amazon Echo? It's a virtual personal assistant that allows you to use just your voice. You can listen to EWTN Radio just by saying, Alexa, play EWTN Radio. Check out the Amazon Echo today. Email us, morningglory at EWTN.com. Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast. And we are Catholic from coast to coast and literally all around the world on the EW10 Global Catholic Radio Network. And I know you're looking for some great gift ideas. Look no further than EW10RC.com. We have a a, a wonderful uh, gift idea for you today. A beautiful religious, uh, a a, a beautiful plaque, Immaculate Heart of Mary plaque. And you should get it because that's my parish is named after Immaculate Heart of Mary. (laughs) It's beautiful. This beautiful image of the Immaculate Heart of Mary is printed with a metallic sheen on a a medium weight fingerboard and framed in turquoise and gold. You just have to see it for yourself. It's absolutely beautiful. Head over to EW10RC.com. Again, check out the Immaculate Heart of Mary plaque. Buy Catholic Shop EW10RC.com. And I'm your co-host for Morning Glory, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. And we're joined by our godly counsel, Father Bjorn Lumberg, and of course, Gloria Purvis. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's going to tell us how we can deserve a break today. <laughs> yeah, oh, wait, no, wait, no. <laughs> <laughs> Look, is that a, the McDonald's thing? We des- you deserve a break today? Is that Well, the- when I was a kid, there was a commercial. There was a song, you know, you deserve, oh, a, you break deserve a break yeah. today. Yeah, McDonald's. see, Father remembers. Oh, Father remembers. okay. Golly, yeah. I don't remember. Okay. That was the one Deacon <laughs> and I were watching. I'm trying to think. I have had actually. McDonald's. <laughs> I've had McDonald's. There's the one thing. I have had McDonald's. I may not have had Twinkies and all that stuff. But I have had McDonald's before, so there. You, you can't say I on, our, but, on our world tour of Gloria's new album release, we will stop on the as roadies. <laughs> there you go. Well, uh, their former uh, CEO, Mr. E- Easterbrook, would like a break today. Apparently, um, so he'd been working at McDonald's for about mm, almost two two decades before he became the CEO in March of 2015. And at the time that he became CEO, the fast food chain was in a financial uh, slump, but Mr. Easterbrook turned in and streamlined their business. He introduced technological innovations like the touch screen ordering that you might see if you go into McDonald's now. So I guess you can um, touch screens yourself and make your orders. And they said he delighted customers by offering all day breakfast. So I guess McDonald's breakfast was super popular. And he's like, hey, why don't we just offer it all day? And by doing these um, kind of technological innovations and um, offering breakfast all breakfast all day, the company's shares roughly doubled during his tenure. So, like he was doing what the CEO is supposed to be doing, you know, making the money for the company, making their um their shares, their stock prices go up. So, you would think, wow, that's great, that's great. But then, in October of last year, a McDonald's employee notified the company that she was engaged in in, in an inappropriate relationship with the CEO. Um, and she told the company she was worried that she would end up getting punished for the month-long consensual rela- relationship, which involves some stuff that I'm just not going to say on the air. So what happened was outside lawyers for McDonald's went and inst- interviewed Mr. Easterbrook, who confirmed he said, yeah, I did have all that. This did happen. And he ensured investigators that he had never engaged in a sexual relationship with an employee. So I guess they took his word for it. They looked at like his company issued iPhone 10 and his iCloud account, but did not find evidence of additional misconduct. They did not review his electronic communications that were stored on McDonald's computer servers. So then the board of directors at the company decided, 
look, we got to fire this guy. And they had to figure out, would we fire him for cause? In other words, for an offense such as dishonesty or committing a crime. That was the big determination um, as to whether or not he'd be fired for cause. And the reason that matters is he would have to relinquish previously awarded compensation, including stop op- stock options that he was not yet eligible to cash in on. So they ended up just firing him. They didn't say it for 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 what do you call it for cause. But in firing him, they said if in the future they determined that he was dishonest and actually deserved to be fired for cause, they had the right to recoup the severance payouts that they gave him. So guess what happened? Just guess. What happened? <laughs> well, you are not guessing. They found out after they gave Homeboy the money and he, and he skedaddled that he actually had not a relationship with just one employee, but with three. <laughs> oh, oh, my gosh. So he not got so a package. Good. Listen, he got a package worth more than $40 million and he rolled out. Oh. So now McDonald's is basically trying to claw back that money. So I'm curious with our listeners. Look, the man did a great job, uh, you know, is in his role as a CEO of making the company money and all these kinds of things. He had a consensual relationship with one employee, didn't uh, reveal the other two relationships. He got fired, walked out with a big payout. Do you think McDonald's should go after him since they found out uh, that he wasn't honest and it was actually three employees? Should they should they continue along this path? What do you think? We'd love to hear from you. You can email us, morningglory at EWTN.com. Now, in case you're wondering, it's not unusual for a few. There have been a few CEOs in recent years who've lost their jobs after, you know, this kind of bad misconduct. The question is people who've lost their jobs and then getting sued by the company to get their money back after they've Mm -hmm. let them go. So that seems to be. They say among major companies, going after a former exec- chief executive officer seems to be kind of rare. Mm. Well, you have to understand how important this guy was to McDonald's. Because uh, when McDonald's <clears throat> went public, started issuing stock, I mean, they were guar- you were guaranteed to make money with McDonald's. I mean, every year, every year they're making money, making money, making money. And all of a sudden, this little upstart called Subway comes into the picture mm-hmm. and then uh and then a few not oh maybe a few years back mcdonald's lost their stocks lost for the first time ever and then uh subway now becomes the number one uh fast food chain in the world not mcdonald's <laughs> anymore so this guy comes in and uh, makes a few really just simple because they were at the time when he came in they were thinking about changing their menu and doing this and doing that he goes no 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 let's do some other things and 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 that gloria mentioned and and turn you know kind of turn things around for them and uh so you can see how important he was to the company from a business standpoint but from a moral standpoint so and that brings up a great question i mean do you are you able to look past some of these moral things because he's making so much money for them but you know, uh, if people find out about it, it's like, well, so what? As long as he's making money, I don't care what he does with his personal life. And and then what? But what about these employees, especially if they're in relationships that, you know, they felt pressure because of who he was, you know, to continue in these relationships? There's a lot of interesting questions there. Well, remember, one of the employees um, said that it was consensual, but she just didn't want to get in trouble if it was found out. That's one of the employees said that. Yeah. yeah. Now, so wow. Gloria, in this case, he what he denied the relationship, the first one. No, he and admitted then, it. No, he admitted no, he the admitted first it. one. He died because, you know, they could fire him for cause if he was lying. So he says, no, I I had this one relationship, so but it was one, not but sexual. Give, why the severance package so big? Just because they wanted Because he's a CEO. And frankly, is right. it all? Yeah. I mean, I was thinking of Michael Ovitz, who um, left Disney after 14 months. And I think he got like $140 million. And in that case, the shareholders, the stockholders like, he was only on the job 14 months. Right. So right, they right, sued. Yeah, yeah. A and lot of wanted, these guys uh, uh, right. have written to their contracts. Right. But now here's yeah. the funny thing. Mr. Ovitz from Disney, in, that was in 1996, left with his $140 million. And even though shareholders sued because he was only on the job for 14 months, the judge ruled that he could keep the money, even though the board of directors for Disney had displayed poor judgment. So mm. he, Mr. Ovitz, got his $140 million. So they're trying to go back and get this $40 million from Mr. Easterbrook because they say he concealed his other two relationships. And the only reason they found out about it is because somebody else 
tip them off. Now, the question I have was, why didn't they look on the McDonald's servers? Why didn't they look? To me, it didn't seem like they really did a thorough investigation the first time around. I mean, that just seems peculiar to me because once they looked on the servers, that's when they found all this kind of crazy, um, the kind of stuff that he had, uh, <laughs> that he used his McDonald's account to deal with these other employees. And in fact, gave one of his paramours hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in stocks or something like that, some kind of compensation, something like that. Um, and so that brought into a question Gosh, not only was he not doing right, he was abusing his ability to give somebody he was in a relationship, you know, all this money. Mm. Do you think that all these corporations now are going to start rewriting the terms of their contracts? No, this is a standard. Actually, it's a standard thing in a lot of corporate contracts. If they fire you and it's not for cause, but they found out that you were deceitful. <clears throat> they can come back. They have a clawback. They can claw back for the compensation. So okay. it's not that it's unusual. The question, though, I'm posing to everyone is, uh, do y'all think they should? What do listeners think? Let us know. Morning Glory at EWTN.com. He made money. He was all this stuff. Is that enough, you think, to just say, you know what? We're going to let you walk off. Or should he have, um, have to relinquish his previously awarded compensation, including stock options, because he was dishonest through and through? When they asked him if there was anyone else, he was like, no, no, it was just this one. I never did that at all. Then comes to find out it was actually, no, it truly really wasn't that just that one. It was three. So, what do you think? Mm, yikes. I think, I mean, like, when you look at how traditionally in Catholic theology, theologians have dealt with the problem of public vice, like, how do you deal with the issue of prostitution in a in a city or something like that? You know, what are you going to do? Um, you don't traditionally um, legislate morality, so how do you do it privately with a CEO? Yeah, yeah, I'm like, true. oust him. I don't think anybody should be in a position of power that abuses that power, even if it's consensual, because it's really not when you're over somebody's pay. I think he right. did wrong. He should get the money back. To me, it's clear. What else? Let's see what else. What is the power of the Eucharist? Catch us any time of day with the EWTN app. Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast. Do you love Catholic Radio? Tell us how it's been beneficial to your faith by calling 205-795-5773 and leaving us a message. That's 205-795-5773. The leading Catholic voices are on EWTN Radio. Part of the success we've had on the world over, I attribute to certainly my relationship with Mother Angelica and her teaching me early on that when you sit with someone, you talk to them, you share with them, and you create an environment where they will tell you things they wouldn't tell anyone else. The World Over with Raymond Arroyo, Thursday night, 8 Eastern on EWTN Radio. If you've ever read the book, The Endurance, it's a mind-blowing story. Shackleton brought a group of explorers and they were gonna go to the South Pole, but instead they got stuck in the ice on the way there. And their boat was stuck in the ice for, what, I think over 450 days before it got smashed and they got out in the ice and they went to an island. It was an unbelievable journey that they all lived through. But here was something that's key that we could learn from The Endurance for how we have to endure our current circumstances. They kept a schedule on the boat. They kept a balance of work and of play, a, a balance of social time, of getting outside, even on the polar ice and a balance of being inside working on things listen you have to keep that balance right now what drives us right now can't necessarily be accomplishing all our to-dos the to-do list comes to an end at a certain time of the day then it's time to play then it's time to pray keep these things going you'll be amazed at how you can get through as you're stuck in the in the ice pack (laughs) on a boat with your family god bless you for more text chris at 44144 this is chris stefanik on ewtn radio Some prayer intentions are more urgent than others. If you need a prayer answered right now, join us today on Take Two with Jerry and Debbie and share your intention with the world. Now, back to Morning Glory. EWTN News Headlines are next. Good morning. This is an EWTN Newslink. I'm Teresa Tomio. It's Monday, August 17th, the Feast of St. Hyacinth. 
Praying for Belarus Sunday, the Holy Father asking for respect for justice and dialogue following a week of violent clashes over a disputed presidential election. The Holy Father says he's entrusting the people of the country to the protection of Our Lady, Queen of Peace. A plan to ensure Bishop Emeritus Michael Bransfield makes some reparation for financial and sexual misconduct has still not been implemented. He headed West Virginia's only Catholic diocese before retiring amid scandal. His successor tells the Washington Post Bransfield won't admit wrongdoing and refuses to arrange amends. A rare thunderstorm moving rapidly from the Pacific Ocean onshore, knocking out power across the San Francisco Bay Area. North of Lake Tahoe as high winds came into contact with an out of control fire, a spectacular tornado shaped spiral of flames was formed. For more news from a Catholic perspective, visit EWTNnews.com. I'm Teresa Tomio, and now back to Morning Glory. On the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Live from our nation's capital, this is Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast with Gloria Purvis, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and Father Bjorn Lundberg. Heavenly Father, today as we celebrate St. Hyacinth, we ask his intercession that we can share his zeal for the gospel for souls and for Our Lady, that we too can put our gifts and talents at the service of bringing more to know you, to put all things in your hands through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 I trusted even when I said, I am sorely afflicted. And when I said in my alarm, these people are all liars. <laughs> it's a cheerful, still trusted, but right? realistic. <laughs> yeah. Still trusted. I trusted. Well, that's, that's the point. So which psalm is that? Yeah, that's the second part of Psalm 116. It's broken into two parts, uh, verses 1 through 9 and then 10 through 19. And these are verses uh, 10 and 11, uh, unattributed. Um, but I love that. I trust that even when I said I am sorely afflicted. And when everybody's lying around you and when you're uh, being afflicted and persecuted, like so many people of faith are today, they still have that that beautiful trust in the Lord, you know, just like the Blessed Mother did. Mm -hmm. Amen. Beautiful. Let's see, what do we have coming up next after this segment? We're going to learn about the interesting life of St. Hyacinth and how it can help us to evangelize. Oh, okay. We'll hear more about that. You know, you don't hear many men named Hyacinth these days. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a, actually a lovely name, I think, Hyacinth and yeah. Hillary. Those are the names I, yes. I rarely hear for men named, but it'd be beautiful names. But right now, Deacon, what are we going to discuss? We're going to talk about uh, what is the real power of the Eucharist. And, of course, we love our Morning Glory listeners, to join the conversation, email us, morningglory.ew10.com. Tell us your first name and how you're listening. Also, we're on YouTube. Just search for EWTN on YouTube. Uh, so, you know, gradually, churches have been, you know, reopening. Uh, and uh, many, many people have been eagerly looking forward to the day when they can finally come back and receive Jesus in the Eucharist. And uh, I know I have friends who have you know posted on social media about the joy they receive. Some even moved to tears when they finally received the Eucharist after months away from the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, and and so there's an interesting story from a young man uh, who had again not received the sacraments for you know about three months, eager to do so again. Um, you know uh, he, he was doing the spiritual communion was, was really getting kind of getting tired of that, you know, and, uh, he could, you know, he was kind of anticipating, you know, he could, he could see himself having this emotional response after receiving the Eucharist for so long. But, you know, that Sunday came, he went, there was no tears flowing from his eyes, despite, uh, seeing a good number of people crying after receiving the Eucharist there was, he had no real emotional response. And, it, it, it perplexed him because I don't, I don't understand it. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I so he started, he started questioning himself. Uh, so after he goes back to his pew after receiving communion, he's, he's questioning, do, do I still really believe in the true presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist? Uh, didn't I promise myself never to take the sacrament of the Eucharist for granted again after not receiving for so long? Uh, God, what about, gosh, did I, did I really make that good confession? You know, um, could it be that uh, I didn't miss Mass and the Eucharist as, as as much as I thought I did? You know, a very interesting reaction when he didn't have that emotional response. So he's heading home, 
He decided to stop at a convenience store to get him some snacks, as a lot of young people do. <laughs> I have daughters that want to do the same the thing. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he noticed that there was a, an elderly lady there um, that was kind of dumpster diving, looking for aluminum cans. And so he reached into his wallet. He, he noticed he had a $10 bill inside and, and, and uh, put it in her hand and walked away, got into his car and left. And he said, well, you know, $10 is not going to, maybe they'll, I'll buy her a meal for the day, you know. Um, so when he got home, it dawned on him that, you know, that perhaps that encounter with that homeless woman, maybe that was the point of the Eucharist. You know, mm -hmm. um, he says he, faith is not always a feeling. Um, <laughs> you know, he, so he went to Mass with the expectation that he would experience some emotional high from receiving the Eucharist. But maybe, but maybe that missed the point. That the Eucharist is not about us. You know, we, we hear that term that you become what you receive. You know, bread broken for others, wine poured out for others, all those kinds of things. And uh, it, it's because of the Eucharist that we're able to do the things that we do. And I, and the way I, I like the phrase that we become Eucharist to the world. We've just been nurtured by our Lord in word because we're fed by the word of God and liturgy of the word and then nourished by the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, then we have to go out and be Eucharist to the world. So I think, you know, uh, that was the experience when Jesus said, feed the hungry, drink the thirsty, clothe the naked. Um, you know, uh, when, when you see someone who's poor, you, 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 you should see me in them. You know, and I think that was the deeper experience of the Eucharist that he had. You know, it's, um, I think it's, uh, people need to make sure they aren't, you know, measuring their spiritual life by how emotional they get. Right. Because um, it's, it's yeah. just not I mean, you can't you can't just like every time like you can't measure the depth of your love of your relationship as to whether or not you get butterflies in your stomach every time you see your beloved come in the room. You know what I mean? Right. That right. as a relationship matures and deepens, it, it takes on a different character than just being the emotional right with any person so too with uh, i think with our lord and especially in the eucharist it's not and you shouldn't necessarily look for those feelings of fancy and delights and stuff like that as you advance in the spiritual life that is not like that's not those are not markers for how close you are um, but it was, I'm, you know, I imagine probably some people may feel like that, may be concerned, like, oh, does this mean that my faith is weak now that I'm not, you know, brought to tears after an encounter with the Eucharist after being so long away? It's just not, um, those are not good, uh, I guess, guideposts for look trying to measure your relationship. Well, I think you look at, too, the tradition of the church confirms this, right? To John Chrysostom, Chrysostom talks about the fact that if you have, we should have beautiful celebrations of the Eucharist and we mm. should use the best for God, but that if we're more or primarily only concerned about the beauty of the liturgical celebration and not the poor who are present, then we're totally missing the point. And then Vatican II talks about, I mean, like we saw this in Body with Mother Teresa, that the the Eucharist is the source of some of the faith and that because we receive him in the Eucharist, we can bring him to the world. Like Mother Teresa would say, she could do the work she did with the poorest of the poor because she received him every day and went and made a holy hour every day. So, yeah, that tie-in between I'm able to go back to Mass and have that great grace, but I don't necessarily feel it, but that I can bring that love of God to everybody, especially the poor. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and Gloria make a good point there about the it's not about the emotion, you know, and I think it's just like any relationship, right? Uh, the, the more you mature in that relationship, then all of the, you know, the, the feelings and the excitement, whatever goes away, but you're still left in this relationship. And so it, it's different, you know, like when I was dating my wife, when she walked into the room, I'd be like, oh, like you think you said the butterflies, that kind of stuff. You know, now she walks into the room and I'm like, just, I mean, there's a joy, like, wow, I'm so glad she's here. Kind of, mm -hmm. a, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. you know, not, not like, oh, the butterflies and stuff. Cause you know, um, but, but, but the, 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 there's a deeper, there's a deepness there that wasn't there before, even when we were first married, mm -hmm. you know, and it's just mm -hmm. like any, any other relationship, like when you, you become a priest and you start doing all the sacraments for the, the first time and it counts this time, you're not just practicing, you do, you know, and, but, and so the, the love is still there. Although the emotion attached with that love sometimes may fade but that love actually is supposed to deepen over time so that you're it's not about the feeling it's about 
uh, how you are, how, how, how you're being in that relationship. Uh, and I think that that's what this young adult man found out. Um, that, you know, he went from being discouraged that he didn't have some emotional reaction like a lot of the people around him, but that the Eucharist is about actually living and becoming what Jesus is trying to do for us in that beautiful sacrament. Mm -hmm. And of course, we love to hear from our Morning Glory family. Uh, we're also on Twitter. Send us a tweet at EWTN Radio or uh, go ahead and email us morningglorywtn.com. Tell us your first name and how you're listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm wondering how, if people want to share their experiences of going back and yeah. receiving uh, the Eucharist after being away. Uh, what was that like, you know, if they care to share? I mean, at the, at some people might say, that's too personal to talk about. But if they're willing, you know, we'd love to hear from you, to love to hear those, uh, you know, that it, it, it maybe it didn't, you know, you didn't have this, uh, you know, emotional thing. That's not what we're looking for. But did, was any, did anything come to mind? Did you have any thoughts? Did you have any any um, thing that you think, wow, after this time being away, what it was like? Or maybe it was just like, you know, Riding a bicycle, you're like, I'm back in the saddle, back going, and, you know, this just feels right. You know? It was crazy, be too, because it's been nonstop crazy since March. You know, first we had to kick in overdrive, figure out streaming, figure out all this oh, stuff. Yeah. And then, yeah. I mean, when we finally got to the point where we're having mass again, I mean, the public mass, the public celebration, mm -hmm. I was struck by how moved I was to see all the parishioners. So I don't want to say I didn't love them to before, the but people. then I was like, I was just happy to have people back. You know, you know and, I wonder uh, what that was like for for priests uh, to go from, you know, saying it in front of a camera and then to come back right. and have people back in the pews. What was that like? And people to point out, you know, a number of articles were written, commentators, very thoughtful pieces about how, you know, how stupid, not stupid, very vulgar, you know, to say mass facing a camera was so odd. It was so artificial. You know, one of the, I was trying to think about that. I'm speaking to the people in the parish who might be watching us streaming, but it was so, you know, such an artificial reality to be sitting in an empty room, if you will. Now, you're going to have just a priest saying mass, all the church is present, you know, the heavenly court is present. Yeah. So in that sense, it's totally beautiful and complete. You don't have to have anybody there mm -hmm. besides the celebrant. But obviously, you know, it's preferable to have even one other person there present at mass. But it did feel odd to be trying to talk to people through a camera while you're trying to focus on offering the sacrifice. Yeah. So when there's actually someone there, it was so much more authentic, if you will. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, you know, the one thing that I was thinking about is, even though I'm sure it felt really odd, I was thinking about how many people, unbeknownst to you, that you were able to, that they were tuning in. I'm, I'm, I'm betting a lot of people who had never stepped foot inside a Catholic church got to look yeah. and see what the beauty of the mass and maybe even Catholics who hadn't been in a long time, you know, yeah. got to tune in and see the beauty of the mass. And I'm wondering if there are people who hadn't tuned in since the Vatican two changes, Maybe, <laughs> you know, yeah. to be like, what, yeah. you know, to see. So, and I keep hearing uh, in my mind, uh, St. John Paul, the great with, you know, the new evangelization, use all the means to get the gospel out there. Yeah. Yeah. I know for a fact, yeah, I said there's some priests that have uh, told me that people have been watching the streaming that they've been doing. And when they look at some of the names of people that have either liked it or followed it, <laughs> these people haven't been the mass yeah. in a long time. You know, mm -hmm. so so the trick is how do you get those people now you got their attention again? How yeah. do you get them eventually to come when when things open up even wider? How do you get them to come back actually to the church mm -hmm. and and be part of the community up, again? About the way you guys spoke about the love of husband and wife. We just had a, a parishioner pass away. He he had been married. They'd been married 66 years. They We did oh, their vows wow. earlier this year. And um, just a wonderful couple. 66 mm. years together. So, wow. wow. Beautiful. Congratulations to them. That's a long time. And I know that must have been a sad thing to part like that, too. Let's Absolutely. see. What else is coming up next on Morning Glory? We're, we're going to learn about and someone else filled the love of God, St. Hyacinth, great disciple of St. Dominic, and how he evangelized can help us as well. And email us, morningglory at EWTN.com. Beat the heat as we go Catholic from coast to coast. It's Morning Glory on EWTN Radio. Page. Living the Beatitudes with Father Bjorn. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. 
St. Jose Maria Escriva says that we are called to light up the pathways of this earth by being sowers of peace and joy. This comes from being aware that we are sons and daughters of God. On the road of life, though, we find dangers, but God walks with us every step of our life, pouring out the gifts of His Holy Spirit upon us. Our Lady is our companion, like GPS in our car, connected to the cloud and bringing the latest updates to help us navigate our journey and get out of traffic on the way to the eternal kingdom. We don't want to get into family fights on our way to God's vacation destination, but we should be these sowers of peace and joy. We shouldn't accept substitutes, accept only the authentic identity of being His children, His sons and daughters. Let's grow in happiness and bring peace to those around us. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. For more about the Beatitudes, visit EWTNRC.com. Here's today's quote from Mother Angelica's Perpetual Calendar. Every time I say no to a small temptation, I strengthen my will to say no to a greater one. The more my will is turned toward God, the greater will be my union with His Son. Mother's Spiral Bound Perpetual Calendar features an inspirational message for each day of the year. It's available from the EWTN Religious Catalog at EWTNRC.com. That's EWTNRC.com. We're on Instagram. Search EWTN Radio. Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast. You know what? EWTN has lots of news, and it's news you can trust. Through Catholic journalism, EWTN News helps advance the gospel and teachings of the church. Get our trusted Catholic news in your email inbox. Yep, we'll come right to you. You can sign up today at EWTNNews.com. I'm Gloria Purvis, and I'm joined by my co-host, the dynamic deacon Harold Burke Sivers. And our godly counsel today is Father Bjorn Lundberg. He's the pastor of Sacred Heart Parish out in Winchester, Virginia. We want to hear from our Morning Glory listeners. Join us in our conversation. Email us, morningglory at EWTN.com. Tell us your first name and how you are listening. Today we have a little bit of an obscure saint, I think, for a lot of people. Today we're going to talk about St. Hyacinth of Poland. Now, Gloria Deacon, did you, either one of you know about St. Hyacinth? Have you heard about him other than his unusual name? <laughs> You know, just that little snippet that they ever, like when you read up on a saint, when you're praying um, on yeah. their optional memorial, just that little bit, but not really much beyond that, you know? <laughs> yeah, not, like, I'm not, I mean, I know he's not on the calendar, the universal calendar, but, and I've right. heard of him, but I don't really don't know a whole lot about him, actually. Well, once I'd heard a story about him, this pious story about him and Our Lady that I'll talk about a little bit, but... Um, I first kind of encountered him, if you will, in 2014. So when I was chaplain at the high school, St. John Paul the Great, we went on a pilgrimage with students and some of the Nashville Dominicans and some uh, parent chaperones to Poland in Thanksgiving for the canonization of our patron, St. John Paul. And so over there, we got to Krakow, and we were like barely awake because we've been flying all night. We're trying to keep everybody awake for mass. Everybody's collapsing in the church. <laughs> but anyways... Mm-hmm. There's a tomb there of St. Hyacinth there at the church, and it's the largest priory, I believe, largest Dominican priory in the world. Some like 60 friars are there. It's crazy. Um, So we got to pray at his tomb, and then I learned more about him. Now, he was kind of personal connection. He was born in uh, near Rocklau or Breslau, depending on the names you use, in Upper Silesian Poland around 1185, so it's over 800 years ago. My family is from Silesia, so it's kind of interesting to us. Came from a noble family. He was trained in Krakow, and then he was appointed a canon by his uncle, who was the bishop of Krakow. So Mm -hmm. he takes him, his uncle takes him on a trip to Rome on church business in 1220, and he becomes a Dominican after witnessing a miracle performed by St. Dominic and hearing his preaching. Both he and his cousin were received the habit of the Dominicans, and then they were mm-hmm. sent along with Henry of Moravia to establish the order in Poland. Now, the guy spent, the, the guy, the saint spent the next 35 years working his tail off. He went and preached in Lithuania, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, parts of Russia, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Lithuania, Austria, Bohemia, Greece, Turkey, some say northern China. So, wow. He was I think all yeah, over the place. From all that, wasn't he? I think if I can remember some of the stories from all his travels in that area, wasn't he known as the Apostle of the North or something like yes, that? Yes, he was. It's one of the things and, I remember hearing about him. I can say. And the, the story that I had heard that I just thought was neat was that when the Tartars were invasing, invading Poland and the convent was being attacked, 
he was going to save the Blessed Sacrament. So he's going to go and get the Saborium from the tabernacle and go off to the forest to try to protect the Blessed Sacrament. And when he was leaving the church, he had a great devotion to Our Lady. And tradition says she appeared to him and said she would never refuse him anything. So he's leaving the church. She says, don't leave my statue behind to be desecrated. And it was oh. huge and he couldn't pick it up. And he's like, I can't carry it. And she says, I will lighten the load. And the tradition is that with the Blessed Sacrament in one hand, he was able to pick up the statue and carry it with him. So just a great reminder to have big devotion to Our Lady. But after 35 years of this, you know, simple little workload he had, he was anointed at the foot of the altar on the Feast of the Assumption on August 15th, uh, mm. almost 750 years ago. He died the same day. His feast day is today. And just his fidelity to this charism of St. Dominic, to put his life without hesitation at the service of the gospel and the call of Christ. And he just gave his youth and his talents and his gifts to bringing people to the Lord. And I just think, you know, we're not all called to evangelize 5,000 countries and to do <laughs> these kinds of extraordinary miracles. But, you know, mm -hmm. we can say yes to this call. You know, like you were talking about the story about the young man, you know, he, he, he appreciates his faith more than ever. He goes to Mass doesn't have this emotional experience, but suddenly he's called to live charity. Mm -hmm. You know, each one of us, you know, are called to do this. You know, like or Gloria's talking about, you know, the role of helping have ethical policies at, at, in, in corporate America or mm -hmm. make the world a more, you know, just an, an honest place. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I just thought it was very impressive that he um, worked these incredible miracles, obviously mm -hmm. loved Our Lady and did this and had this. I mean, nowadays with cars and transportation and technology, you could maybe think about I'm going to visit all these countries, but he's walking everywhere. Maybe I guess. I know, right? Forest. I was thinking the same thing. Now, wow. Even if you're riding um, in a wagon, I mean, that, yeah. that takes, that is not fun. I'm sorry. That yeah. is, I don't care how luxurious, that is just not fun. That's not no. fun. So he was doing that. And I'm thinking about all the languages he had to be able to speak to go to yeah. all these areas and That's be right. able to uh, preach to people and teach the people and um, that he was willing to do it is I think fantastic. I had heard um, one time that he had crossed some, walked across some waters of some deep river um, and that it was sort of like a miracle how he had crossed the river. And they were saying that, um, that legend had that, that some of the footprints of his saint, of this saint remained on the water even after he'd crossed the river. So they were saying like when the stream was calm, you could see his footprints Oh, on cool. the water, like this is one of just the the stories of a miracle of um of this particular saint when he was uh, trying to cross some water. I just I, I find all these all these uh, stories about saints and their miracles so fascinating, and wondering what kinds of effect that would have upon the local populace. You know, well, it strikes me too that when you read the stories of these founders, Saint Francis, Saint Ignatius of Loyola, Saint Dominic, mm -hmm. you know, times Mother Teresa, or Saint Jose Maria, different people. They seem, you know, with their charism to be able to move souls to give themselves with generosity. You mm -hmm. know, like, you know, how many people would just suddenly, oh, I met this person and I'm going to just go become a missionary somewhere. But they did. You know, St. <laughs> right. Dominic sees him, performs a miracle, is preaching with amazing gift of preaching in Rome. And this guy's like, okay, I'm going to go be Dominican or I'm going to go follow Ignatius. Uh -huh. You know, it's, I just, yeah. I find that fascinating. Obviously, that doesn't happen with everybody, but. This, wow. this generosity is is an impressive thing. So hopefully we can get more of that today. I, you know, I think so. I, it, it, you, I like how you're thinking, Father. Hopefully we can get more of that today. The world will never be uh, hurting. Uh, you yeah. know what I mean? We are always in need of people and generosity and things like that. So I think that's important. I agree. So let's hear what our Morning Glory listeners have to say. We got an email from William saying, what Deacon Harold experienced is what should be taught to all the first communicants so that after they've had their first communion, they can go out and see the things that they're, they've never noticed before. Mm. Uh, actually, it wasn't my experience. I was just sharing right, the was about of, a, to say, what? of a young, of a young man, but still, but that's the thing, you know, you, your first thought after mass should be, Oh, let's go to McDonald's. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. How can I be, how can I make myself Eucharist to the world? So beautiful. Thank you. Uh, we also received an email from Donnie. She's recounting, when I went back to Mass and received the Eucharist, I almost said, thank you, instead of <laughs> amen with tears. <laughs> wow, Have a blessed good. week. I understand what you're saying, Dottie. 
we got email from Katie in St. Louis. I had a newspaper article. I read a newspaper article yesterday citing polls from Pew and Gallup indicating an increase in religion and spirituality due to the pandemic. Love your show. Hey, that's great news. Like you know that. what? I remember um, hearing after September 11th in New York City that the churches were packed up there yes. Yes. for a little yes. bit. Yes. You know, I think people were getting touched. Let's see. You know, I bet people are getting touched now. Yeah, exactly. And we got an email from Steve in Pennsylvania. Thank you for highlighting the issues concerning the former McDonald's CEO. While he did much to build up the company and increase market share, he also did not live the values McDonald's expects from all their employees. Expectations are set by the organization, and it takes the CEO as the leader to set the example for all. The generous golden handshake, or sometimes the golden parachute as it's called, <laughs> provided by right. the board of directors likely rings hollow.